Gambling addiction doubles within 50 miles of a casino. 8.6% of property crime, 12.6% of violent crime in counties with casinos was due to the presence of casinos. So pretty strong data showing a correlation between crime and gambling. The industry wants to say is, oh, you know, you're going to get all this extra revenue because people are going to come here and gamble. Well, the people who come here and gamble are the people who live everywhere they put a casino in this country, outside of very few places like Las Vegas and Atlantic City. Um, the majority of the money going into the casino is coming from people who live around the casino. 15 years across the country, uh, it has no impact on expanding uh, retail sales. Gambling costs states more in taxes than they bring in. that there's not a legitimate debate on these issues. There is good information out there, but it's not known by the people that are making decisions. And the challenge that I think we all share in this room is helping those decision makers make good decisions based on good information. But as I've been involved in this for the last 25 years, uh, and as will become, uh, I, I can't wait to hear what the Richie's have to say. I've already heard some of the things. It's, it's, it's not enough just to have good information. Um, have to reach people's hearts as well as their heads. And this title, uh, How to Talk About the Link Between Gambling and Crime, um, I, I put this together to talk about what do we know about gambling and crime. And, and sort of at the core of it, that's what this presentation is. But uh, beyond that, it's how do we take what we know about it and, and share it, um, get it in the hands of the people who are making decisions about it. I put my lanyard up here, right? Can you see my name? <laughs> What's the, the point of a lanyard? It's so that we can we can tell each other the names. But when it's way down here, like yesterday, I'm trying to look up. There's a lot of new people here. I'm trying to figure out who they are. And, and <laughs> right? right? This is our challenge. This is our challenge. Our our decision makers are trying to see our names and they're down here and they don't see them and it's, the, the communication isn't happening. So up here, you see my face, you see my name, you're not looking at my crotch, that's embarrassing, right? <laughs> avoid that. Um, I put my, my, my lanyard up here just to remember, remind myself that um, it's, it's, the, it's the, we start with the stories. And I don't know if you recognize any of these pictures up here. Anybody recognize any of these people? None of them? Well, let me introduce you to him. Uh, Sister Mary Margaret and Sister, I can't remember her name, California. I uh, run a Catholic school there, uh, which is $500,000 poorer because they took the money out of the school and they gambled away. Matt, recognize that guy? Where's Pat? I'm on here. You recognize him? That's our banker in Sydney, Nebraska. He embezzled uh, $160,000, I believe. And then did a recording with us. And uh, Pat and I worked in Nebraska for many years. Uh, he did a recording with us to help us publicize this issue. Let's skip this guy for a second. Uh, woman second from the left ran a nonprofit in Ohio, embezzled money from that, nonprofit shut down. One on the far right. Is a business manager for, I believe, Alanis Morissette or another rock star. He embezzled, I think, $5 million from her, gambled it away. So these are real people who have done crimes that they otherwise would not have done if they hadn't gotten involved in gambling, very likely. There are a lot of reasons why people commit crime. And the gambling industry will say, well, it could have been, like, I don't know what you say about two nuns stealing $500,000. What else would motivate that? I don't know. Uh, this guy, this guy I skipped over. Uh, officially, they don't know why he did this crime. And if you don't recognize him, 
That is the, the, the number one mass murderer in the United States. He shot hundreds of people in Las Vegas and killed 60 of them. And somehow the official inquiry couldn't connect that in the week before he did that, he lost $1.6 million of the slot machines, according to his brother. And in fact, he'd been gambling at the slot machines nonstop for years. He was a, a slot junkie. He was an addict. So they were all addicts. They all did things that are crimes. And when we talk about the impact of gambling, on harms, that's the harm. I don't know if you can read this, it's kind of small writing. I want to give you the data, but I also want to tell you how I share the data. And I think it's impactful. And I, these slides will be available to you. I don't know. We'll send them out, and there's links to, to the sources so you can follow up on those. But several years ago, I spoke to the Lincoln Independent Business Association, and this is how I started out. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. What drives a police officer to rob banks? What motivates an elementary school principal to steal $20,000 from student funds? What so captivates a young mother that she forgets about her baby waiting in the heat of a parked car, waiting and dying? These are all stories, right? This is, these are things that are happening to real people. These are the stories that your decision makers need to hear. If we knew what caused these things, would we change our constitution to invite it into our state, into our city? These stories, by the thousands of the reality that have accompanied the spread of casino gambling across our country, because of stories like these, over 90% of casino proposals are rejected. 10%. Or not, and 10% every year, now we have casinos, a thousand of them across the country. The problem is addiction. Air Force Technical Sergeant Gloria Calhoun, a 17-year veteran with an exemplary record, was court-martialed in Arizona for writing $14,000 in bad checks. <coughs> Brown County, Wisconsin, Deputy Treasurer Barbara Berger embezzled $197,000 from her county over three years. Hillsdale, Illinois, Fire Chief Bill Phillips siphoned over $150,000 from his fire department before killing himself. What would justify bringing that into our state? Tax revenues? Jobs? Gambling causes crime. We have to translate that into things that people are going to hear. And that audience that day saw the impact of gambling in a very real way. And that state rejected that proposal, actually two casino proposals on the ballot that year in 2004. And they were both rejected. So I wanted to couch what I'm going to talk about with Brian in terms of sharing it in this way. And I'll end with a similar one. But in the middle, we're going to actually look at some data. So there's four things, a lot of things that, that, that policymakers hear from gambling promoters. Um, I'm going to share four of them with you in some responses. The last one is crime, and then we'll go into the detail of crime. Gambling is just a form of entertainment. Right? We've already heard that today. Is that true? Gambling addiction doubles within 50 miles of a casino. We learned that from the, one of the few things we learned solidly from the National Gambling Impact Study Commission report back in 1999. We know that addicts provide roughly half of the revenue of rapid bet slot machines. And here, I've got all the citations on the slide, so you can take this to your policymakers and, and, and take them right to the source if they're interested in finding that out. Actually, um, Robert Williams up in, in uh, Canada and Alberta measured 62% of the money going through slot machines there was coming from people who couldn't control the gambling. And these slot machines provide 75% of casino revenues. So in a nutshell, as has already been said this morning, casino profits depend on this modern, addictive, rapid bet technology. And your decision makers, the public, lump all gambling together. I love, Matt, your idea. We've got to kind of tease out this modern, addictive, rapid bet technology. And I'm talking rapid bet. Here, do this with me. Like, hit your table once every two and a half seconds. One. Each one of those is a new bet. And I used to think that's pretty fast. 
once every two and a half seconds. And then I heard that these wonderful people in England changed the law so that that was getting maximum and then minimum. You, you couldn't bet any faster than every two and a half seconds. And I thought, well, what kind of restriction is that? That's as fast as it is. <laughs> and then I sat next to a, a guy in Alberta at a conference earlier this month, and he tested machines, and he said they rejected the machine because every six to seven minutes, the machine went into a special mode where you got extra bonuses the more times you bet. And people were going like this. Each one of those was a bet, and he said you could watch the credits drain. And the gambling manufacturer said, oh, you can't reject that machine. That's our most popular machine. Right? Their definition of entertainment is, so if people play it, they must like it. It's also their most profitable machine. And this kind of machine has never existed in the history of the world. People say, oh, betting's been around forever. Gambling's been around forever. They they bet on Jesus' clothes and his feet of the cross. You know, this has not been around forever. This is a technological change in our modern society. And this is singularly rapid bet gambling, the one thing that's draining accounts more than any other thing. That's the heart of it. So that's what you say when they say gambling is just a form of entertainment. Gambling brings economic development, jobs, and tax revenues. All right, as Les said, I've done a study on this 15 years across the country. Uh, it has no impact on expanding uh, retail sales, and in fact, it actually has a slightly negative impact on employment in areas that have casinos. I'll talk about that later today, so we'll just keep moving. Um, a guy who does consulting for the gambling industry did a study on taxes, and he found, to his surprise, and mine too, that he actually reported it, uh, gambling costs states more in taxes than they bring in. We need these casinos because we need the revenue stream. Well, if it isn't going into your retail sector, it's going into the casino instead, then the taxes on the retail sector are disappearing. They're not getting that money anymore. It actually costs states more than they can. Only a small percent get hurt, and we have funds to help them. You heard that? I hesitate, because there are people in this room that have taken advantage of funds to help them and been helped. But I will tell you, Nobody accesses the programs, and those that do, there's no good measures of any significant number of people being helped anywhere. This is all the smoke screen. I talked again in Alberta, and one of the presenters said that 10% of the people who needed help uh, uh, accessed it. That's the highest percentage I've ever heard anywhere. I've heard 1%. And that of the 1% that access it, only 1% show up, and of that 1%, only 1% follow through, and of that 1%, only 1% stay out of gambling for another year. We don't have programs that work. The gambling industry really isn't interested in there being programs that work. They're just interested in saying, we gave this much money to this program. And the programs are interested in reporting, well, they can't report, well, we, we, we help all these people. What they report is, we got this many phone calls. We need outcome measures if you're in that community. And you know we need outcome measures, but we don't have them. Canada, they're trying to create a framework. Hopefully, uh, again, not my field. I just want to say there's not much effectiveness here. And public policymakers don't know that unless you tell them. Right? They don't know that if your land you're hanging down here. It's got to be up where they can see it. And you guys, that's, that's your charge. Lots of things cause crime. We really can't say the gambling does. All right, we really can say the gambling does. The, 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 the connection between the two is well recognized, the stories that I've told already. We see it around us, and the public sees it because 
they know people that have done crimes and they have people in their families. So the stories are widespread. Uh, DSM-4, I think Matt mentioned DSM-5, now we're on, is a manual for uh, defining uh, addictions. Uh, in DSM-4, it said, in fact, that crime was an identifying condition of problem gambling. That's how we, one of the ways that we knew that, that the person had a problem. That was taken out in DSM-5. We'll talk about that in just a second. The typical process, this is not a surprise to anybody familiar, and it won't be a surprise to people who aren't unfamiliar. It's, uh, okay, I gamble a lot of loose money. Oh, I'm in debt. I gamble some more and chase the money that I lost. If I could just win it back, then I'll stop. Well, I'm not going to win it back. I lost some more. Oh, okay. Uh, then I would borrow from my son's uh, college savings plan. I'll gamble that. When I get it back, I'm... Oh, I lost that too. Oh, no, I'm, my wife's going to kill me. I'm going to borrow some money from the till of work. As soon as I went back, I'll pay it back so they won't know. Financial stresses emerge. It leads to theft and fraud. Thousands of cases of this. So gambling interests on both levels, anecdotal and the data, they're messing with it. So like, National Gambling Impact Study Commission report had people come in and testify their own personal stories, and the gambling company said, oh, they're just anecdotes, they're just anecdotes. We need data. And the gambling industry had a hand behind the scenes in changing the definitions of DSM-5, picking out the crime piece, because they don't want to be associated with that. And I could I left some slides out of this presentation to go into more detail on some of the ways that the gambling industry is messing with the, the information available to decision makers, but they got a lot to gain from doing it, and it's not a surprise that they're going to do it. I mean, they're, they're putting out reports that aren't that are really bad, but they look really good. So we have a study, thanks to Earl Reynolds and David Mustard, in 2006, they got FBA statistics across all the whole country, and they found uh, pretty clearly 8.6% of property crime and 12.6% of violent crime in counties with casinos was due to the presence of the casinos. Pretty solid stuff. Well, it says the industry, uh, crime data is not that reliable, which is true. Crime data is really messy. Right, the two nuns, they don't show up in crime data. The Catholic Church didn't prosecute them, they were never arrested. But what do we count for crime? Charged with a crime, we count. Arrested, we count. Convicted, and each jurisdiction keeps their own records, and that's not consistent across their so, so crime data is messy. I would argue it's messy in a way that way under-reports crime. So probably these conclusions from Grinnells and Mustard are higher. The other critique was, well, you know, with the casino, people are coming in from outside and gambling, and then, and, and then so, so there are actually more people in the county, so we need, to, we need to do the percentages not on the population of the county, but the population of the county plus all the visitors, and when you do that, then the percentages go down, it's really not a problem. So Reynolds and Mustard did another study. They said, well, if that's true, then there should be higher crime. Then we should see this happening also in other places where visitors go, like national parks. And so they looked at the national parks, and hey, crime didn't go up in those areas, strangely. So they refuted that visitor tourist problem. And, and honestly, in the face of it, again, something that, that the industry wants to say is, oh, you know, you're going to get all this extra revenue because people are going to come here and gamble. Well, the people who come here and gamble are the people who live here. Everywhere they put a casino in this country, outside of very few places like Las Vegas and Atlantic City, um, the majority of the money going into the casino is coming from people who live around the casino. And so it's kind of crazy to think that visitors are increasing the, the, the crime rate, but it's not the visitors that are gambling, it's the local people. How many of you have been to, 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 to Shreveport, Louisiana to gamble? Anybody? You know, it's the people in Shreveport that are gambling there. And when they put a casino in New York City, it's the people from New York City that are going to gamble there. And 
crime is going to increase there because of that. Oh, well, people are going, are going to Connecticut now, so if we bring them back, I mean, we're already in that crime, right? We should just bring them back for that argument, right? In fact, we know from studies, the Omaha Chamber of Commerce did a great study, whether we put a casino across the river from Council Bluffs, Iowa, in Omaha, Nebraska, what's going to happen? And it makes the amount of gambling increase on both sides. In, in Canada, Windsor put in casinos. And Detroit said, oh, we got to have casinos because everybody's going to, yeah, like 500 or 555. Five, five. My brain's not working on orders of magnitude. Say $50 million is going over to, to Windsor. So they put casinos in Detroit. And after they put casinos in Detroit, um, $70 million got lost by Michiganers in Detroit. And another $70 million got lost by Michiganers in Windsor. The whole market increased. They didn't keep money from leaving. In fact, more money left. Plus, they were draining it out through their own home city. So that argument doesn't hold water. Another review uh, in 2018, uh, looking at studies of crime and gambling, found uh, elevated rates of criminal offenses by gambling addicts have been consistently reported across clinical and prison populations. And these are mostly surveys, right? You go into prison, you survey prisoners, have you had a gambling problem, what crimes have you done, and correlate that. Or people who are in some kind of therapies and also tracking uh, their, their crime. So more evidence. And the industry says, well, you can't really count surveys because there's other factors, right? They're probably on drugs, which they not necessarily, but more likely are. Probably have mental health issues, probably heavy alcohol users, all of these can be affecting their behavior. It's not gambling. I mean, you can't say it's the gambling. Well, I have to tell you, the criminals are not very patient. So they respond to this. In John Pence Law Review article, which I'm sure you'll hear uh, uh, law Review, uh, the University of Illinois Law Review, one of the articles is this study uh, from the Quinte Exhibition Raceway Survey. And let me tell you uh, well, a little bit of information about it. This is a gold standard survey. The idea of this study was that it was, it was, there was a plan to put a casino into this town of Quinte in, uh, in Canada. And the Canadians Thank heavens for the Canadians, because they actually have funding to do gambling studies that isn't controlled by the gambling interest. And they said, hey, this is a great opportunity. We're going to study this population before the casino goes in, and then after the casino goes in. Five years, and we'll see what impact does it have on all kinds of things, including crime. So they set up the study. They started gathering data. And they set it up in such a way that it's really a gold standard study. Are people being honest? Um, it turns out they are honest on, on things you wouldn't think that they're honest about. Uh, within the chronology literature, if you ask them if they've done crimes, they report. If they know that they have confidentiality. And the casino industry tried to crack this study. That uh, The first year data came in, and uh, a, a lot of crimes people reported that they had done. And the casino industry tried to get those exposed and prosecuted and the, the funding and the government said, no, this has to be confidential. We need this information, and they, they, it is confidential. So over the five years, the, the, the participants had that trust. And, um, and they asked the questions that allowed us to identify that population. Did they have a gambling problem? Did they have an alcohol issue? Did they have a mental health issue? Did they have a problem with drugs? So that we could correlate these things. Did they do crimes and what crimes? Really cool data set. The conclusion was, being a problem gambler appears on average to increase one's likelihood of committing a crime by 4.3 to 7.6% when the nearest casino is 64 miles away. So in fact, they didn't build this casino. I don't know about the situation up there. What I've heard is the gambling industry had some influence on that too because they didn't want these results. But they still continued the study and finished the study and the study, uh, there were casinos nearby. If you were closer than 64 miles away, those percentages likely would go up. Again, we know that the addiction rates double within 50 miles of the casino. The critique 
it came back is, well, maybe there's attrition bias, and that's influencing the data. Attrition bias just means um, we surveyed in year one, we surveyed again in year two, and year three, and year four, and year five, but every year some people dropped out, didn't, didn't continue with the survey. And, and if people drop out, and they're disproportionately among some of these groups, and in fact, the, the, the ones who were the problem gamblers dropped out more than the ones that weren't, then that can affect your data. So we got a new study in project, in process. I'm working with Earl Reynolds, I'm working with Jessica Wells, who's a criminologist, and the discussions between the two of them are fascinating. And we look at just the first year data. So there's no attrition bias, nobody's dropping out. We've got a data set that's large enough and asking the right questions. Uh, 3,065 people, and then oversampled another 1,000 people, uh, people who were at risk of or exhibited uh, problem gambling, uh, met problem gambling criteria. And there's different ways of measuring problem gambling. Uh, four different scales in the study. Uh, the one I'm reporting is the SOG scale, which is pretty standard, but we ran the data on the others and there's really not a lot of difference. Okay, I'm sorry about this slide. The best I got. We're in process, but let me kind of unpack the key things here. On this side, we ran the analysis without mental health and substance abuse, like drug, alcohol, and mental health. Right, we've got that data, but we ran it without. Uh, on the right side, we include as, as control factors the, the, the drug, alcohol, and mental health. The random, random sample result, uh, the, those 4,000 people, Two different analyses. These pluses mean a statistically significant correlation between the two. So in that random sample, even not accounting for mental health, alcohol, and drug abuse, we have a statistically significant relationship between gambling and crime. We include as control factors alcohol, mental health, and drugs, still on, on violent crime and on nonviolent crime. The pluses are statistically significant to a 95% confidence interval. On this last analysis, it's statistically significant at a 90% interval. So pretty strong data showing a correlation between crime and gambling. So they say we can't tell. You tell them, yes, we can. And you show them the studies that I've given them. And we'll have a study out on this for you in a few months. It takes remarkably long, but we're doing it. Uh, last thing I want to share, because we're talking about casinos and, and, and the world is now online and America is low to that game, thank heavens. Uh, this conference in Canada had this iGaming funnel and, and the presenter said, so here's how it goes. First thing they want is customer appreciation and promotion, acquisition and promotion, and then macro sports betting. I bet they win the game. I bet they cover the points today. Then micro sports wagering. I bet the next, day, next play is a pass play. I bet this guy's gonna fumble before that guy fumbles. In-game wagering. But the goal is casino wagers. The goal is as fast as possible, because the faster they gamble, the more they gamble. It's a volume thing, and that's where the money is. And it's on our phones right now. More than you know. So online sports betting is in 33 states. The analysts are saying, I got two quotes from two analysts from just this last week, we see no evidence that sports betting is working as a profitable growth driver for anyone. And the other one, the slow pace of online casino legalization, intense profitability pressure, minimal regulatory hurdles will drive operators toward more sports betting products that emulate casino games. DK Horse is an app announced within the last month. It's available in 12 states, and they expect it to be rolled out in all the other states. And it's on your phone, and it's, it's DK Horse. One of the elements of it is um, historic horse racing. Historic horse racing, some of you are familiar with. I am in a movie in Idaho because we had it for two years. They said it's just like simulcasting. Legislators went down and said, no, oh, it's like a slot machine, and they threw it out. Because it is like a slot machine. You have a horse race in the corner, nobody watches, and people are going like this. Things are spinning. And it's on an app through 
DK, DraftKings, and it's on your phone. So how is this going to affect addiction and crime? We don't know. We can't measure it. This has never happened in the world, but we have this other data that suggests it's not going to be pretty. Okay. This is the last slide. I'm going back to the stories. This is one of the stories that kept me in this fight. You know, I don't care one way or the other about gambling, but I do care about the truth, and I do care about people getting hurt. More Casey was a superstar back in the day, wrote for the day newspaper, wrote this. Mary Thomas had been the town's race tax collector for 14 years when she was arrested at the age of 58 for embezzling $65,000 from the town's taxpayers more than two years ago. Vivian Chamnus, blah, blah, blah. They have closed, blah, blah, blah. All these women have several things in common. They were trusted, long-time employees of companies and government offices where they labored away quietly and reliably in jobs they held for years. They had access to public funds or high volumes of cash. They did not have criminal histories. They were all middle-aged or older, and they were all also gamblers, slot machine players specifically. Their addictions to the machines and the adrenaline rush they delivered were so strong that it drove them to commit crimes they probably would not have dreamt of otherwise. Since the state's two casinos have opened their doors, there have been a spike in the number of gambling-related white-collar crimes committed in Southeast Connecticut. You need to talk to the reporters, too. A very similar story appeared in the Nebraska publications this month, last month. It had pretty much the same details, except it completely left out gambling. And maybe in Nebraska, the clerks weren't hooked on gambling, but my guess is, given that the paper was sponsored by one of the two casino companies, we're not getting the full story. All right. All right, so we have a question or two for John Roots about his presentation on crime and, and gambling. Okay, comments, questions, yes? If, uh, that reference you made to the gambling consultant looking at the taxes, what taxes? Property, sales, all taxes, just some taxes? Yeah, he did a kind of a pretty careful study. Sales taxes were certainly a big part of it, but there were other taxes too that were affected by the revenue stream going to the casinos instead of being spent in other places in the in the uh, area. Uh, but the the link to the study is on the slide, so yes, you can thank follow you. Follow it up and see the details there. Appreciate it. All right. Good job. Uh, two quick things. First of all, the Grinnell's mustard study, which John mentioned. Uh, was published by Harvard and MIT. When you talk to decision makers, go crime, 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 published, 10 year study, published by Harvard and MIT. There, there's no doubt about this, and the re most recent one is in the Illinois Law Review here that John mentioned. One other thing, there, you get two copies each of this, uh, Ohio Northern University uh, Law Review has an article which covers about 65-70% of what John just said. So pick them up. <coughs> thank you. All right, John Cruz, thank you very much. <laughs> so